Maybe you've wandered into this place today. I hope you didn't wander in here. I hope you came intentionally. And you are like the millions and millions that are especially in our country right now. Uh, there is a label on them that's called the emergent. Uh, they are revisiting something that the devil is doing, and that is putting the great question, can any man ever know God? And uh, can, is truth something that you can grab hold of and put in a box? Is truth something that can be written in a book? Uh, is there truth or are we just on some great journey of faith and we never really come to the truth but the journey is what is worthwhile I want to be very candid with you with no emotionalism whatsoever that there is definite truth and there is a definite Jesus Amen. that the Evans just sang about that before the world was ever made that God desired to exalt above every name. And that Jesus was the eternal word of God, the son of God before man was ever made. And by his own plan, God the Father ordained that Jesus, his son, would be the creator of the world. He made all things in six literal days. And he made all things for the purpose. Uh, it was, he was the maker and he was also for him, for Jesus. This creation that he made was to do something, and it was to exalt him to even a higher position than he ever had before the world began. For the first time ever, it was possible for the Son of God to show his true character in the Godhead by revealing something that the universe had not seen before, and that was totally one-sided sacrificial love that would love beings called humans that were unlovable. And God the Father, having counted the cost before he ever made Adam and Eve, knew that they would reject him, and he knew that some would not believe on his son and that they would spend eternity because of his justice and holiness in a place called the Lake of Fire for not believing in his way of salvation. However, Having counted the cost, it was of a greater value to God the Father to exalt His Son over all the period of time and allow the Lord Jesus Christ to come and to die on the cross and to redeem those who would believe on Him. So then in eternity future, there would be a great remnant of believers, the chosen, the elect, who had believed whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely. And they did in this lifetime. And he was good to his word and saved them through the great love giver, Jesus Christ, who laid down his life. I say that to you because that is truth. And all who will believe on the Lord Jesus, which is God's provision for your salvation and forgiveness of sin and for your purpose, will forever be a co-heir with Jesus Christ of glory in a place called heaven. And forever you will get the opportunity to walk with Jesus Christ and to praise him and to worship him in this high elevated place as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you can receive him today by believing what I just told you. He died and was buried and rose again out of total love of his own heart for you. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that is the Lord Jesus, believing what he did out of great love, shall be saved. He is the only truth. He is the way. You know, any, any, people can write books, and this emergent church situation is basically a, a woodstock in the church and of today that believes that you can't know anything and the rebelling against all that is church and all that is really what we hold dear of doctrine. Will you take that message to these 20 year olds, these 20 somethings, they are in the thousands and tens of thousands in the millions in America right now and they have forsaken everything that their fathers and their grandfathers have taught them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you confirm to them by your testimony Christians that there is truth? And it's all right to put God in the confines of this book, and that's really who he is. He is really who he revealed himself to be, and we can understand what he has revealed himself to be. If you're not saved today, at the end of the service, I would encourage you to seek out a pastor or a leader 
who can bring you to that Jesus Christ. I'd like to preach to you a message entitled, The Three Individuals of Ministry. The Three Individuals of Ministry. Father, take these words that are designed for believers right now, and I ask that you administer to the heart of our members, of our regular attenders, and those that come to Lighthouse, that they would have the opportunity to live your purpose for their life, the gifts that you've given them, the talents, the abilities, that they are for your reasons and your purposes. Fill me with thy Holy Spirit. I very humbly come to you in need. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 9, if you would. Mark chapter 9. This morning we are going to step away from Hebrews for a week. And uh, I'd like to talk about something that we have not focused on in our preaching for some time. It's a matter uh, within the body of Christ. And that matter is being a minister to those around you. Being a minister or ministering to those around you. And really living out God's purpose for your life. That is not just the idea of getting by on a day-by-day -day basis and fighting Satan and waiting for the rapture or for your death. God gave you, he made you who you are, even how, the gifts that you have, the spiritual gifts that he gave you after he saved you, even the situation and the environment and the family that you're in right now, they are all by God's design purpose for you to minister for him. And that's what we're going to talk about. Ministry is a very general word. You know, it's often applied to everything from being an usher in a church to building houses with Jimmy Carter, okay? Ministry is a broad kind of idea, and it's defined all kinds of different ways. If ministering simply means that everyone should have a job in this local church, then ministry is only an arm-twisting kind of thing. It's only a guilt-driven kind of thing that may be for the greater good or may not. It, it may just be that ministry is that pastor, the pastor or assistant pastors needs X amount of workers for X amount of positions. And certainly there is a lot of workers that are needed to keep the function up at Lighthouse Baptist Church. But I want to show you from Scripture today that God spends a heap of time in the Word of God talking about Christians ministering for Him. And that He intended every believer to be ministering specifically to other believers around Him or her. And the greatest forum of believers ministering to believers is, of course, the local church. Ministry is good works for God, doing good works for God. In the New Testament, as I looked over and studied this through in preparation to the sermon, and you're going to see many of the verses being brought out today, if you'll just listen, I won't point this out again, but most ministry in the New Testament, I should say most ministry in the New Testament, is in the confines of one believer ministering to another believer through the abilities and gifts that God has given them. Not so much the idea of doing good works to unbelievers, though that is very clear in Scripture, that we are to do good works to under, uh, other believers, that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Ministry, and when it's talked about in the New Testament, primarily or mostly, the majority of the time, speaks of one believer ministering to another believer. God saved us to do good works to others. And that's one of the purposes that he has for your life right now. We all seem to grasp at different times of our life, have quarter-life crisis or midlife crisis or past-life crisis. I guess you don't have past-life crisis, but, you know, in the end-of-your-life crisis. What is my purpose? Why am I here? And maybe you're not that morbid of a thinker, but there are many who, you know, who come to different places and stages of their life after they have children or become empty nesters or even in their 20s and uh, uh, end of their teenage years saying, you know, what is, what am I, what am I here for? I want to tell you that part of the reason that God has you here and doesn't just save you and then kill you and take you to heaven is that there is a purpose for you to minister to other people. He has his great kingdom work to be done through individuals that are ministering to other believers. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Are you looking forward to the rapture? If you are, say amen. amen. All right, we're supposed to be looking for it, but what do we do until that time? Or are you supposed to twiddle our thumbs and say, okay, I'm saved, I got my ticket to heaven, I just sit around, or I, I'll just do whatever I want to do, I'll feel what I want to do, and I, you know, I deserve it, so I'm going to do everything you know, fun in this life. No, listen to, the word, listen to what it says. We're looking for the rapture 
uh, from Jesus, our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify him to, to himself, a peculiar people zealous of good works. The Lord did not save you to warm a pew or a chair if you come at, to Lighthouse, which, by the way, has a nice lumbar area right back there, and, and I like the, the handles. I like it a lot, all right? You don't have to sit right up against the, the person beside you, but that's all free. He didn't save you so that you could just sit there and watch other people minister to you. He didn't just sit there so that you could come and let me, by preaching, minister to you. He, may, he saved you so that you individually would be zealous of good works, so that you would engage in good works. And a large part of that is ministering to the believers around you in your local church. Our English word minister or ministry appears in 67 different references in our New Testament. 67 different passages use the word ministry or minister. Of those 67 passages, there are six different words in Greek that represent all those 67 passages. Six different words that our translators choose in the context to pick a different word that, to, to fit in there. That means ministry. That is ministry. Let me tell you about those six words really quick, the original words. The first one means to wait upon or to be a servant. Sometimes it appears minister in the New Testament, and sometimes it appears the word deacon. The second word means to furnish beside or to fully supply or con contribute. The third word means a public function, like the minister of the interior. People are called ministers that have certain positions. The fourth word means to bring something or to present, to minister that way. You're bringing something or you're presenting something. The fifth word means a toil or to task, to do a toil or a task. You're ministering in some toiling way, tasking way. The last word means a subordinate, a servant, a minister to somebody else. And these six words give us our idea of what God wants us to do to occupy until he comes. Notice that all the words are very similar. They lead to a very specific meaning. And that purpose is, check this out, get it. It is doing something, some good work for someone for the sake of someone else. I want to say that again. I want to slow it down. Ministry means that you are doing something for someone for the sake of someone else. That is what a New Testament minister is, the 67 places it appears in your Bible. That I am doing something for some body, person, some good work for the sake of someone else. And let's talk about that in a minute. If you look there in Mark chapter 9 in verse number 38, you get what will be our passage. We'll refer to other places, but always keep your finger here through the sermon, and we'll come back to this. Notice what the Bible says. It says in Mark chapter 9, and verse number 38, And John answered him, saying, Master, well, let's pick up to 37. I want you to get really the context as we come into it. 37, Whosoever shall receive one, this is Jesus talking, one of such children in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. Sounds a lot like children's ministry in verse 37. Ministering to children. Verse 38. John answered him, saying, Master, uh, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us, not in our camp. And we forbade him, because he followed not us. But Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. Verse 41. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Or I'll reward him for it, even if it's a cup of cold water in my name, because you are a fellow believer, you belong to Christ, and he gives you a cup of water because of it, I will reward him. I'll never take away that man's Reward. Now here is pure ministry. It is found in verse number 41 and the context. Pure ministry, but do you recognize it? Do we recognize it and do we know why it's ministry? At the heart of ministry, folks, there are three people. There are three individuals. Whenever someone does authentic ministry, it involves three individuals that we'll talk about today. You'll notice that the disciples, they really blow it here with rebuking a solid believer of Christ who is serving Jesus Christ that was ambitiously serving Jesus Christ and casting out demons in his name. Now this, look at me. 
This was, don't get confused about time periods. This was the time of the apostolic miracles. The apostolic miracles happened very specifically in a time when the, ap the apostles were alive. These had seen Christ. They were given great power to do all kinds of miraculous things to jumpstart the local church, to jumpstart what we enjoy today. When those, a minute, when those apostles passed away, so did these miracle gifts. So don't get stuck on that or don't think that this is some kind of story made up. Okay, This guy was casting out de devils during that period of time in Jesus' name. The devils, the demons, this stuff was very obvious at that time, and so were the miracles. It's interesting when they see these guy, this guy doing this. He's not from my camp. He's not from my local church. He should not, he's not following me, so he must be the enemy. Jesus said, what are you, are you crazy? Are, what are you thinking? What a self-centered kind of view, Jesus says. They thought that since he wasn't in their camp that he was doing something wrong. This kind of reminds me of fundamental churches that look at other fundamental churches as the enemy because they don't do things exact, though they hold the doctrines of Christ. And though they are serving biblically the Lord God, we attack them because they are not at 1842 Arts Chapel Road. And we look for reasons to be mad at them, though they hold to the doctrines of Scripture. These things should not be. Jesus rebukes them and then focuses on the heart of ministering in verse number 41. I want to read it again. Look at it there. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. The understanding of ministry here lies in the understanding of these three persons in this verse. The three relationships, the individuals involved. Now, can you find the three people in verse number 41? Now, look, we'll, we'll go through it. It says in verse 41, for whosoever, that's the first guy. That's the minister, the one who is doing the ministry. He is, he is hopefully you, the one that is doing, giving a cup of cold water. Let's look at the next guy. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water. Now, this is the guy who gets it. This is the one, the minister E. I don't know there's a good word for that. The one who gets the ministry. So the first guy is the one who gives the ministry, does the ministry. The second guy is the one, there's a, a warm body. There is someone who is receiving it. It's obvious here that it's in Jesus' name because they belong to Christ. It's the Christian who's being ministered to. And there's a last person in here. For whosoever shall give you a cup of cold uh, of water to drink in my, in my name, there it is, because you belong to Christ. It is the master. It is the one that we minister for. Okay, so you got the three people here. You have got the one who's doing it, the one who's getting it, and the one that it's being done for. That is the master. Very simple. Let's start backwards with the master in verse number 41. He says that this person gives a cup of water in his name because that person who is getting the ministry belongs to Christ. That's the reason. The focus of spiritual serving must always be, folks, the Lord. You can you say amen to that? Are you alive with me? All right. Are you dreaming of baked beans that Pastor Pritt was talking about? All right. Listen to me. The one that we are doing it for must service, must be the Lord. I believe a lot of Christians, myself included, when we do ministry and we get bummed out about it and we get tired of it, of it we don't like the people that we're ministering to, we don't feel like doing ministry anymore or we won't, don't want to do ministry, we all have got our, our eyes on the wrong place. It's what we want to do, or it's if it fits in my schedule, or if it's I don't like to do that, or whatever. But it's rarely, we say it as a cliche, but are we ministering? Are you doing whatever ministry you're involved in for the Lord? Or to the Lord, as we shall see in a minute. He is the purpose. Serving Him is the reason for ministry. We must understand that it's much more of a cliche. In fact, you should be, if you're awake and alive this morning, and I said, we're going to serve for the Lord. And everybody would say, Amen. that's right, I'm going to do it for Jesus. I do it for Jesus. Then the first time we don't feel like doing it, I can't make it. I don't want to do it. I don't quit that ministry. I don't feel like it. That's, uh, you know, that, I got a soap opera run during that time. I can't do it. You know, I can't, can't make it. I got to wash my hair. I got to wash my dog. I got to, you know, I can't do that. Don't feel like doing it. But, all right. For the Lord. For the Lord. Okay, it's not a cliche. I'm talking about, imagine the Lord being here on this stage. And us doing ministry for him, for his purpose. That's what ministry is. Serving in a minister here at Lighthouse must never become a hobby to you. 
simply a thing that you do because of tradition. It never must be a personal possession to you, something that you guard because this is my ministry. Don't you tell me how to do it. It's mine. It's mine, 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 mine. Something's wrong there. I don't quite think a person that is protective of their ministry like that selfishly is doing it for the Lord. They're doing it for themselves. Or it should never, ministry must never become a God of its own. Well, my purpose for Lighthouse Baptist Church is that ministry. No, it's not. It's the Lord. You know, the ministry is part of serving or doing it for him. We minister because it's God's purpose for us right now. We are doing it, that cup of water for Jesus. We minister to others because they belong to the Christ we love. Did you catch that part of the verse 41? Look at it again. For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, and then he puts in this phrase, because ye belong to Christ. I wonder, uh, let's pick one of the nursery ladies. They can, I think they can hear us. Let's pick one of them. I wonder if the ladies are ministering to those babies or to you as parents who can put your babies in the nursery because you belong to Christ. Now that's a different thought, isn't it? And that's a wonderful thought. Did the ushers seat people this morning? Because you belong to Christ, I give you this cup of water. That is a freeing and a wonderful and a joyous thought. I'm doing it because that person belongs to Christ and I love him. And I'm doing it because that's one of his possessions. Wow, that's good. That's a great, that, that stirs my soul. Hold your place here and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Ministering is for the master. It's for God. It's God's idea. We are doing it for him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse number 4. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. You'll recognize this as a great passage about the body of Christ and those ministering as members of the body. In verse number 4, I, I want you, as we read it, though, to pick up how many times it talks about that it's being done for or by the Lord. The Lord inserts himself in nearly all the verses here because he wants you to know that ministry is never divorced from the Lord. Now, there are diversities of gifts. Now, look, but the same spirit. This is 1 Corinthians 12, 4. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. Okay, he's involved. Spirit, verse 4. Lord, verse 5. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God. There he is again, who worketh all in all. Uh, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Okay, over and over and over. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. Another, discerning of gifts. To another, diverse kinds of gifts. To another, interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit. Look, what I want to point out, there's a lot to point out in the passage that we won't. But the, the number of times that God inserts himself in this process. Because the gifts that he gave you were for his purposes. He is the designer of ministry, not your pastor who tries to think up of another way to take up your time. Not the youth pastor or the music pastor who tries to attack your calendar so that you don't have time to ride your motorcycle. I throw that in because I love motorcycles. Okay, ministry is by, is working by the Spirit. It's his idea, it is his plan for us to minister to each other. This is the classic passage on gifts that are given to born-again believers to minister. The miracle gifts were given to launch the church age, as I've already said, but many other gifts and other passages remain. Gifts like helps, coming alongside of somebody to help them. Governments, leading, uh, ruling, teaching, preaching, uh, mercy, uh, teaching, all of these are things for us to do for the master. And they're not your church leader's idea. They're God's idea that you minister. Consider whose purpose these gifts are. They're for God. Verse 4, the same spirit. Verse 5, the same Lord. Verse 6, and on and on and on. God's working, God's working, God's working. It's his idea for you to minister. And the forum of the local church is the local body of believers to do that. People using their gifts to serve others is God's purpose. It's for him, not for yourself, not to fill a position, not to put a warm body on a clipboard. It is for God. It's not to gain position or influence so you can control that ministry or you can get involved in there and to be seen. It's not for the preacher. It's not for the youth pastor. It is the purpose. It is God's purpose for you to minister. And he will use those gifts in the forum of that ministry. Now, he made you a certain way. He made you what you are both in looks, in hair, 
and whatever, metabolism, but then also gifts and abilities and uh, to sing, to not to sing, to have a certain uh, gift of compassion and not helps, all of these things. What God, he doesn't make junk and he made you for his glory. And he made you to minister, to give the cup of cold water to other people. That is his purpose for your life until Jesus raptures you. It's for him. When you do a task, a responsibility, a service for other that God has given you, it's an opportunity to do for him. We must never lose sight of the person you're really doing it for, the Lord. Remembering this when you go to a ministry, when you decide to get involved in the ministry, when you decide to serve in some purpose around this church, remembering this will give your ministering life and vibrancy, vibrancy that when you come in here and you've got to do something, sing in the choir or whatever you've got to do, or you come to Hearts and Hands, or when you, when you bring that can of soup next week, or whatever it is, it's for the master. It's for the master. It will give you purpose and joy and desire. That's not a cliche. It's God's word. And how this would revive me, and I, and I used it. I already used it, brother. I thought, I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to stand up here, and I'm going to preach for Jesus. That helps a lot when people throw tomatoes. Or when they go to sleep or whatever. Or when they don't like what they hear. I'm doing it for Jesus. For Jesus. That'll help you tremendously in ministry. It'll help you to come. It'll help you to sign up for ministry. It'll help you to come to your ministry. It'll help the, the diapers in the nursery not to smell so bad. It'll help all kinds of things if you know you're doing it for Jesus. In fact, I'm going to tell you even stronger that you're not just doing it for Jesus. You're doing it to Jesus. You say, what are you talking about, you weirdo? You big Christ said if you minister to people, you're ministering to him. I want to give you the context of the Matthew 25 passage I'm about to read to you. Some call it the judgment of nations. There's not a lot in scripture about it, but we just know that there are these people in eternity, a real judgment, that are going to be rewarded for the things that they have done. And I'll say there, because I'm ignorant to this theologically, it's a real judgment. I'm not exactly sure what it is in eternity. But I know what he says about it. Listen to the words. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hunger and fed thee? We're talking to Jesus. Matthew 25, 37. Or thirsty and gave thee drink. Now get this. When saw we thee a stranger? The verse before, Jesus said he was rewarding them for doing all this. And they're like, what? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in? Or naked and clothed thee? I think you'd remember if you put clothes on Jesus' back. Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king, Jesus, shall answer and say unto them. Now listen what he says. Okay? The previous verse, he says, I'm going to reward you for doing this all to me. And they're sitting there looking at each other, these believers, and they're saying, I never did that to him. They're thinking that there's a glitch in the computer screen for, you know, rewards that you get in heaven or something. They're saying, we, you know, and they say straight to him, verily I say unto you, or they say to him, when do we do this? The king shall answer and say to them, verily I say unto you, inasmuch, look at this, as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. You must get the impact of that to be the minister of God that wants you, that God wants you to be. Every ministry that is done even to the least brother, whether that be children or the one guy, you know, who most people don't want to hang around because he makes them feel uncomfortable. They're a, he's a least brother. He's a, he's a, 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 a situation, a, a need, whatever. To the whatever, Jesus says, when you have done it to the least, the guy that no one even thinks about, the guy that it's done in secret, look, you do it to me. Jesus is rewarding people here for feeding him and giving him drink and housing him and clothing him and ministering to him when he was sick and in prison and visiting him. And they say, we never did that. And he replies, when you did it to the very least of my brothers, those that are saved, you did it to me. When you keep a, a baby in the nursery, Jesus says, you keep me. Wow. When you went to Churchman's Village this afternoon, you sang to me. Jesus said, when you sewed a pillow for the missionaries in hearts and hands, I put my head on that pillow. You did it for me. You, put, you made that pillow for me. Now listen, this is what God says. It is fairly truth that every ministry that we do to our brothers in Christ, 
we are doing it to Jesus. If we would believe and practice this, it would revive every usher and children's worker and choir member, every nursery worker and deacon and pastor and prayer and missions team worker and king's kid worker and hearts and hands ladies and building team, etc., etc., etc. You're ministering for Jesus. No, more than that, you're ministering to Jesus. Who could deny if they had availability and they were able and ask to do some ministry. Who could ever deny it if they knew that Jesus was the one they were doing it to? Who could ever? If you knew that Jesus was going to be sitting in one of those wheelchairs at Churchman's Village this afternoon. And you were going to be singing to Jesus. Every believer in here would be there to sing to Jesus. Every believer would be here. And I'm not making a put in a guilt because you can't do every ministry. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that when we minister... We have got to understand what it really is. It is to Jesus. When you wipe the, 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 the snotty nose of some child in some Sunday school class, you are wiping Jesus' nose. No blasphemy. I'm just saying that Jesus is very clear that that's what he's going to reward you from, for in heaven. Now that's a whole different attitude, isn't it? Ushering serves the Lord? Yes. Special music pleases the Lord? Yes. Nursery? Yes. First touch? Yes. Visitation? Yes. Canvassing, yes. Writing to the missionaries, yes. King's kids, yes. SWAT, yes. Men's prayer breakfast, yes. Church work days, yes, yes, yes. You're doing it to Jesus. Don't serve or join a ministry from guilt or need or arm twisting. Join for Jesus. Literally. Imagine him asking you, will you do this for me? Wow. There are three individuals in ministry, the master... But then as we turn back to Mark 9 and look at the cup of water in Jesus' name, verse 41, we see the second individual, and that is ministry. The second individual is the one who gets it, who, who drinks the cup of cold water. Who gets it? Who gets it handed to him? The person's receiving the labor. These are getting the cup of cold water. This person is thirsty. They have a need. They need refreshed. Someone has thought enough to give them something that they need. They see a, a tired and a hot and a sweating person, and they hand them a cup of cold water because they're God's child, because they're a fellow believer, because it's for Jesus, and it's to Jesus. The ministry, if you'll open your eyes, folks, there are needy people sitting all around you this morning. In fact, let's do it, do it as a general group, all right? If you have needs in your life right now, say amen. amen. All right, if you don't, please come see me because I want some of what you got. No, no. We all have needs, and most of them are never spoken of in any prayer meeting. They're not all financial or food or medical needs. Many are emotional and spiritual and family needs of the people and the believers sitting around you, all around these chairs this morning. Some are children who need spiritually fed. Some are adults who need a burden bearer. Some are your age who need someone to come alongside of them. Some are you, and I know because I are one. God has designed the local church as an operating room for sinners and a therapy center for saints. When we do some job at the local church, the goal is to be a blessing to others, not just to accomplish the task or fill the position with some warm body. When you do a ministry, think of others. You're doing it by Jesus, for Jesus, to Jesus. And the means of that is giving that cup of water for others, to others. God will use your spiritual gifts in the process of you doing some task, whatever job. The job is the forum. God is using you in that forum or in that ministry of ushering or nursery or whatever. God is using your abilities and your gifts to do his kingdom work. And that is the truth. Do it out of love for others. Touch people in love. However you're minister, whatever you do here, put the personal touch in there. Do it not just to fill a position and not just to learn a Sunday school lesson to teach to young people and not just because you know we need somebody else in the parking lot or we need somebody else put the personal touch of love realize what you're doing ministers should not have bad attitudes we should not if you're a servant of the Lord you're doing it to Jesus and you're giving it in love to other people there's no room there for a bad attitude there's no room for self there's no room for Lording, there's no room for an edginess or a frankness about you. You got to lose that all for others. 
Philippians 2, 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. True ministry must be from a humble heart trying to help others. Not to assert your talents. Look what I can do. No, it's not about that at all. It's to be a blessing to other people. Not to assert your gifts or not to concert, concert, uh, assert your control. I want to be a part of that ministry because I want to do this with that. I want to do, no, 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 no. Humbly yielding yourself to you, to the use and the needs of others. A prideful servant is no servant at all. You say amen to that? Amen. Romans 15, 1 says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. That's ministering. Galatians 6, 2, bear you one another's burdens and, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You see that somebody's tired and sweating and you hand them a cup of water, you, you be all that you can be for them. You love them. You forget yourself. The problem is we are looking for the cup of cold water instead of looking to give it to somebody. We live in such a me time in 2009. You can turn on any television station and you watch it for a half an hour and hear a bunch of commercials about you owing it to yourself. What does that mean? You deserve it. That is man worship, and it must not, it has no place in the ministering in your local church. All these passages point to the needs of others. The fact is, it's an all inclusive concept. When you usher, usher for others. Don't be frank or cranky. When you serve on some team, serve there for others. When you sing for church, sing to touch the hearts of others, not so they can hear what a wonderful person, Spranny, you are. I think I hurt my voice. <laughs> do it for others. Let us lose ourself and do it for others. Care nothing for power and everything for others. Deacons, when you deacon, care nothing for influence. Care everything for your caring group, for people. People. When you come to minister at this church on a regular basis, let your cry be the old song, Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I might live like thee. With long suffering and grace, I ask some of you who do nothing for the Lord and, and nothing for others in this place, how will your master reward the cup of cold water when you give no cup? You enjoy the ministries of others to you and you gulp down water like there's no tomorrow. But what about others? What about you giving something to others? You never engage your gifts and service back to them. Ministry is God using your life your, for, and how he designed you and the gifts he gave you for others. May I gently ask you, are you not involved in ministering because it was frustrating somewhere in the past and you started looking at men and you quit? Have you, maybe it's you have not been asked to do it. And if I would stand up here, and I'm saying this in a loving pastor, not to belittle anybody. If I'd stand up here and make a big deal of you doing something, maybe you would do it. That's not ministering. That's not serving, that's lording. Maybe you're just not interested. Maybe you only want to receive, not to give. Maybe you've been burnt out. You don't have time. You won't take the time. You don't think you're needed. You don't want to be committed. You, to all of these, I would gently say, Ministry is God's idea, not this pastor's idea. We saw that. We saw it in a cup of cold water. We see it in 1 Corinthians 12. It's for the Lord. It's for the, by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit using gifts he has given you to serve others through some work, some opportunity among other believers. All excuses melt away when we all agree that ministering is God's idea. There's a third individual in ministry. It is, first of all, the guy who gives the cup of cold water or excuse me first of all the master and then the menace uh, the one minister too but then there is the one who does the ministry the minister the guy who hands the cup of cold water that's not the pastor the minister turn again to first corinthians 12 and i want you to see some verses beyond first corinthians chapter 12 Look now at verse number 18. It says, but 
this is 1 Corinthians 12. Here's some pages yet. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet, yet but one body. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. These are, look up here. This is all representative of people here. You are different parts of the body of Christ. He's using the analogy for you to understand how important it is that everyone minister. Look what it says. Uh, verse 21. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts, or even that's an ugly idea, uh, have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part that lacketh, that there should be no schism or division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. So what's that all mean? When the Holy Spirit hands out spiritual gifts to Christian, it is like a physical body. Some parts are not as outwardly a high profile and not as beautiful or not seen more of men as others. Some Christians use their gifts in visual positions, some behind the scenes. Some may have the idea that they wish that they had greater gifts and some may sinfully look down at other people who have very little gifts and think I'm better than them. But this passage blows that thinking all away and shows us the, the foolish pride and silliness of a human body that would think that. That the hand or the eye would say to the hand, you know, I don't need you, I don't need you, I don't need you. Oh yeah, I'm going to poke you. That's a great analogy to wake you up. I don't need this or I don't need this part or this part. That's silly. Verse number 25, every member should have the same care or concern one for another. That means that all, men are, all members are necessary to minister to each other. No one should consider himself of no value or no gift or of no use in the body of Christ. That's wrong. And if you are not ministering, maybe you're a hand and, I, and this church is one-handed. We'd sure rather have two. It sure would minister to each other better if we had two. That's wrong thinking. It's not the case at all. If you will minister to others and allow the Spirit to use your gift, God will work through you to minister to His children. And you will change also. You will learn humility. You'll learn to be others-minded. And you'll find that purpose of what you're striving to find. God gives you purpose when we live. For the purposes he designed us for. When we use those gifts and those talents and those abilities for him, not for ourselves. Everyone can do something for the master to serve others. There may be, you may be very young here. You may be very old. There is some place you can serve. Some ministry for you to do. Even, on, even if you were paralyzed in our church, there are at least three praying ministries in this church. That The, the whole ministry is about praying. One of them is taking place right now as men gather over in the office and pray for me to have power with you by God. Okay, so no matter what your condition, God can use you. You, you say, I have uh, other more pressing things to do. Really? No, I, I'm, 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 really, I'm really questioning that. Really? You have something that is more important than serving the Jesus who died for your soul. You have something that is more important than loving others the way Jesus washed the feet. You have something more important than that, more pressing. You're too busy to give a cup of cold water to a Christian brother because of Jesus. Friend, life is going to pass you by. And what you're going to have in your hands are things at the end that didn't really matter. And they're going to write on your tombstone, he fished a lot. I remember when a very popular comedian died. I think it was John Candy. I think that's right. He died. And his epitaph was this. He made people laugh. Wow. Is that the kind of things that you're going to be holding as the purpose of your life when you die? She cleaned a lot. Okay. Or would you rather somebody write on your tombstone and say at your funeral, she served Jesus by serving others. Man, what would that? He was a faithful man of God ministering in his church because he loved others and he loved his Jesus. What a great thing to have in your hand when you enter for the rewards in heaven. 
Here lies the complete definition of ministry. Ministering is allowing God to use your gifts while doing good for him to other people. Church ministry is not the functional idea of a pastor. There are good works that God uses to touch physical needs. That may be through making meals or giving money or laboring or working. Biblical education needs, teaching or writing. Guidance and leadership needs, emotional needs, counseling needs, spiritual needs, sympathy needs, helping hand needs, functioning to make this place. Some, uh, some of us don't realize what it takes on an, an, us every Sunday basis to make the things happen around here and to minister to people. And you can be part of that. Worshiping the master, meeting the need of the ministry, and being a humble minister. Three individuals of ministry, and I close by asking you just personally, are you ministering? Are you serving God's purpose for your life? He made you who you are. Some of you took lessons when you were a six-year-old little girl, and he did it for a reason. He allowed that sovereignly for you to use for his purpose. He gave you a voice, and it wasn't for your shower. you don't sing I'll sing again <laughs> he gave you gifts spiritual gifts of great compassion for you to use times of waste in ministries where the action is will you minister would you bow your heads please